Inclusivity is fundamental to game design, ensuring that any player, regardless of gender, sexuality, race, beliefs, and experiences, all have the opportunity to play and be represented within that play. However, due to the games industry hegemony, games have often and primarily been designed for audiences of cisgender, heterosexual white men, particularly young white men. Individuals outside of that identity are often poorly represented within games. Thus, while the video game landscape has become far more inclusive with radical increases in diversity, both in representation and in the workspace, those who make games, even with the intent to be inclusive, often fail to properly represent non-heteronormative white identities. A result of this heteronormativity is the use of bisexuality as a game mechanic, which, while inclusive to all players, including queer players, fails to meaningfully represent queer and non-heteronormative identities. The use of bisexuality as a mechanic de-emphasizes canonical sexuality in order to provide more options and agency to the player, resulting in a lack of meaningful queer representation. Mechanical bisexuality ensures that romance options presented in a game are not constrained by character sexuality thus enabling a player of any gender or sexuality to romance, or have a relationship with, any character in the game. While acknowledging sexual diversity in a game's player base, mechanical bisexuality for in-game romance is not a means to genuinely represent queer identities within the game. Rather, these mechanics are a means to create player inclusivity, in that in-game romantic agency is not constrained by character sexuality. The release of Fable marked the first instance of functional bisexuality in games, emphasized through the rigid sexuality indicators. While uniquely inclusive towards diverse sexualities at a time when diverse sexualities were largely condemned, the representation in Fable is ultimately dismissive to queer identities. As Adrian Shaw explains, instead of representing queer identities, Fable ultimately defers to the player's own sexuality in order to determine queer representation. The game treats character sexuality as a form of emergence rather than embedded representational content. Upon starting the game, the exclusively male character has a list of evolvable statistics which encourages emergence and roleplay. Player action determines the experiences of the male protagonist as well as the protagonist's statistics, including a sexuality label. Initially, the player's sexuality is listed as unknown, but updates to either heterosexual or gay depending on who the player chooses to initially marry. Afterwards, if the player chooses to marry an additional character, one of the opposite sex to their first marriage partner, the game will once again update the sexuality label, this time to bisexual. Fable engages in queer representation by commodifying sexuality as a label determined by player action. Through the game's bisexuality mechanic, every single character, male or female, is, at the very least, attracted to men, as they are implied to be attracted to the male protagonist. However, no character truly behaves uniquely based on their sexuality, giving all romantic agency entirely to the player which, in essence, turns representation into a button. During play, the player unknowingly chooses whether or not to hit that button, impacting the sexual representation in Fable. But for players who are unaware of the existence of that button, the game, as Adrian Shaw discusses, forces that player to continue consuming the game's heteronormativity. Stephen Greer articulates that Fable encourages roleplay, but in order to roleplay being gay, straight, or bisexual, the player is required to decide the protagonist's in-game sexuality. Ultimately, mechanical bisexuality makes queer representation optional when it should be embedded. Diverse representation in any form has the power to impact the player's worldview and beliefs through clearly communicating different experiences or identities, which the player may not have personally experienced. Games, like books, may challenge their audience's strongly held beliefs through the empathetic representation of themes, concepts, experiences, and identities which may have previously been quite foreign to that audience. So, in order to be effective, representation must be meaningful and sincere.
The queer representation in Fable, while somewhat noble and progressive, ultimately fails at representing queer identities. In putting the gay in games, Shaw emphasizes the detriment of this failure. Queer readings may allow for audiences to compensate for a lack of representation, but that does not preclude a demand for representation. Rather, it signals that queerness is always already a part of straight media, and thus does not have to be seen as something at the margins. Fable offers the potential of a queer reading, but this queerness is determined through emergence rather than representation, and is therefore ineffective at meaningfully representing queer or bisexual identities. Despite the failures in representation, the use of bisexuality as a game mechanic continued beyond Fable and, through evolution, was implemented in more meaningful ways. In 2015, Don't Nod released Life is Strange, a game featuring Max Caulfield, a bisexual player character, and her childhood friend, Chloe, a lesbian. While the sexualities of these characters were more clearly communicated in later games, comics, and marketing materials, their canonical sexualities within the first game are unclear. Due to a focus on character relationships within the game, the sexual ambiguity of the first Life is Strange is narratively confusing. Unlike Fable, the narrative in Life is Strange is primarily embedded, so the outcomes of player choices, including that of sexuality, are all present within the game's embedded narrative frame. While Max is technically bisexual within the first game, the game does not explicitly reference this identity, unintentionally allowing the player to project their own sexuality onto the character. Within the embedded nature of Life is Strange, the player may choose for Max to express romantic interest in either Chloe or Warren, a male student at her academy. Max's sexuality cannot be changed by the player, but the depiction of her sexuality is determined through a player choice, so Max becomes a representation of the player's sexuality regardless. Much like Fable, the player must choose for Max to express queer romantic interest in order to view the game's queer representational content. This narrative oversight is fundamentally detrimental to Life is Strange, as meaningful representation is lost. However, unlike Fable, the queer content, when seen, is relatively genuine and sincere to the queer experience. Discussing the evolution of queer representation throughout the Life is Strange series, Mallory Littleton, senior narrative designer at Deck Nine, the developers of Life is Strange Before the Storm and Life is Strange True Colors, states that we knew that players had gotten a lot of value out of being able to choose the sexuality of their protagonists in previous titles, but we knew there was a hunger to have a protagonist that was canonically queer. For those who do not manage to hit the queer button in Life is Strange, the representation is largely effective, even if that sexuality is not technically canonical. In both Life is Strange and Fable, character sexuality is determined through the player's in-game romantic decision, making the player character functionally bisexual to create both queer and straight romance options. However, both of these games are constrained in the use of that mechanic by virtue of predetermined character gender. In these games, all romantable characters, regardless of their gender, are, at the very least, attracted to the predefined sexuality of the protagonist character. Therefore, it is only the player character who is mechanically bisexual. Stardew Valley represents an evolved form of a mechanical bisexuality by allowing players to choose the gender of their character. This simple choice fundamentally impacts the implementation of the mechanic in that not only is the player character functionally bisexual, but every character within the game is also functionally bisexual. Stardew Valley is quite inclusive in that the player may choose their gender and marry any available non-player character they choose to, regardless of their gender. Additionally, players may change their gender during their play, being quite inclusive to trans players as well, who do not want to sacrifice their entire in-game farm just to play as the correct gender. As Stardew Valley operates on long-form emergence, with no definitive endpoint, inclusivity becomes crucial to ensure that any player can meaningfully represent their identities within the player character.
Where Stardew Valley falls short, however, is that characters, including the player's own character, is part of a gender binary, meaning the players who identify outside the gender binary, such as non-binary, gender fluid, gender queer, or agender players, cannot truly represent themselves in their fictional fantasy character. Indeed, this is why the term bisexual is used to discuss these romance mechanics as opposed to polysexual, pansexual, or omnisexual. The functional bisexuality in Stardew Valley succeeds in that it treats same-sex relations as normal. These relationships function identically to the straight relationship options with no changes in dialogue or identity labels. By being inclusive and emergent in the formation of in-game relationships, Stardew Valley provides the player with complete agency over their farm life. Due to this emergence in agency, players who are questioning their gender identity or sexuality can use Stardew Valley as a sort of playing ground for identity experimentation. As Jade King puts it, players may therefore explore their queerness without the presence of homophobia or transphobia. This inclusivity encourages the player to roleplay within their own unique identity. While Stardew Valley is inclusive in its romance options, the failure to represent canonical queer diversity constrains the representational space, because bisexuality as a game mechanic de-emphasizes canonical sexuality. The characters in Stardew Valley are only truly queer if the player decides to pursue queer relationships. As King again explains, Stardew Valley is fully dependent on the player's own identity and actions to form queer or straight relationships. While relatively inclusive, Stardew Valley's romance options are hardly diverse in their representation. As a mechanic, rather than an identity, bisexuality fails to adequately create sexual diversity, instead conforming each character to a default unspecified sexuality determined through player action. While giving the player's narrative agency creates meaningful emergence, giving the player agency over the existence of queer representation limits the potential to promote equity and shift cultural mindsets. If the existence of diverse representation is unclear or hidden unless a player takes a certain sense of action, then the only people who experience that diverse representation are those who are already in that represented group. Representation can only shift worldviews and create cultural normalcy if that representation is clear and exposed to all players, including those outside that represented group. Bisexuality as a mechanic effectively manages to separate queer and straight content, treating the two as radically different experiences, but by doing so, fails to genuinely normalize queer experiences within a greater cultural context instead treating them as their own separate culture. At the same time, while bisexuality as a mechanic falls short in representation, finding a solution to the problem poses an altogether different dilemma. Universal bisexuality may not be true to the queer experience, but more realistic representations may be less inclusive, as far fewer characters would then be queer, even if only mechanically queer. As a result, queer players would have fewer romance options, restricting emergent queer experiences. Likewise, as players may see video games as an escape from an oppressive world, decreasing relational agency for queer players would be devastating, creating a less inclusive game experience. Accuracy towards an unjust world is not an effective solution either. While homophobia is a real aspect of the queer experience, it should not be reflected unnecessarily within a game. This is particularly relevant if the game is intended to be emergent and inclusive to a queer audience. Games should not conform to marginalization, but radically reject it. As Adrian Shaw explains again, In a fictional world where I can use magic on a regular basis, where faces carved in rock talk to me, and in which I battle fantasy creatures, that particular types of reality and marginality are reinforced in the Fable games is curious. In order to create meaningful representation within games, queerness must be normalized and distinct to all audiences. Only then can meaningful equity be achieved.